Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm a compliance evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 349 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions. And as a new service offering for Advanced Compliance Solutions, I'm pleased to offer the Compliance Alliance. The Compliance Alliance is a three-step program which will provide you and your team a background into compliance and the FCPA so you can consider how your product or service fits the needs of a compliance officer. It includes a compliance boot camp for your marketing or ELT team, sponsorship of a podcast series, and in-person compliance sales training. Those interested should contact myself, Tom Fox, at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Today I have uh, a real treat for you as I interview Jesse Eisinger and Paul Pelletier of or about Jesse's book, The Chicken Chick Club, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives. It is one of the most important books, uh, I believe, from the summer of 2017. The Everything Compliance podcast gang discussed it in episode 16 of Everything Compliance, but here I have the author and one of the prime sources of the book. It's a really interesting uh, interview. I think you'll learn very much more. I will um, link to my blog post about the interview and my book review of the book, as well as the Everything Compliance podcast. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report, which is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. And you are in for the treat of treats today because I have Jesse Eisinger and Paul Pelletier Jesse is the author of the, I think, the best book of the summer, The Chicken Chick Club. He is an award-winning uh, senior reporter at ProPublica. He has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. Previously, he was uh, the Wall Street editor of Condé Nast Portfolio and has been a columnist for The Wall Street Journal. Paul is a well-known white-collar practitioner uh, at Pepper Hamilton in Washington. He was with the Department of Justice for quite a while and he is one of the interviewees and sources for the book. Uh, I found this book to be incredibly um, important, incredibly readable, and something that I just could not put down once I started. So, gentlemen, with that somewhat long-winded introduction, welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you for having me. And thank you for having me, Tom. Jesse, I wanted to start with you uh, and just ask the basic questions. Uh, what what drove you to write this book, and what was your methodology for putting it together? Sure, and uh, it's your self flattering about the book. Thank you so much. Um, so I uh, wrote a lot. I'm a financial reporter and a Wall Street reporter, and um, wrote. About, I've been writing about the financial crisis since really before it happened. I was at the Wall Street Journal, and I wrote about subprime starting to blow up in 2005. Uh, and then I went to a magazine that was run by Condé Nast and wrote about the looming financial crisis and uh, leverage at the investment banks, and then they blew up. And then I joined ProPublica, uh, which was a young um, nonprofit investigative news organization and immediately launched into a investigation of what bankers knew and when they knew it about the financial crisis. And I was privileged enough to win the Pulitzer Prize with a colleague of mine, for that series of stories. And we really underco- uncovered a lot of what we thought was serious wrongdoing in the CDO business, the collateralized debt obligation business. Um, and after that, we sort of waited for the charges. We waited for criminal charges to come in. We thought uh, that a lot of people would be nailed for this, and nothing happened. Um, and we waited and waited, and nothing happened in the CDO business, and nothing happened in the mortgage backed security business. Nothing happened with Countrywide or Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was a utter mystery. And after that, we thought, I started thinking, like, what, how can this be? And I started to interview uh, defense lawyers and bankers and executives and prosecutors. To, on FBI agents and anybody I could get my hands on to try to figure out what had happened, and that's why the book came. So, Paul, what uh, what did you, what was your role in all of this? Well, I, I'm, I'm not so sure I had a role except to say that um, I talked to Jesse a lot uh, during 
or after the, the, the crisis. And, and um, I, 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 what Jesse's talking about, I've lived. And so in talking to Jesse, I realized that Jesse sort of had, had a, a, a keen view into what was happening, but more particularly what was not happening. So, um, and I had read a lot of what he had done and he had a perspective that I had not seen any other reporter have a much broader and much deeper perspective. So, uh, from that point forward, I, um, I, uh, I read with interest what he was doing about it because he would continue to write about it. And I, I obviously talked with him a lot about my perspective, um, in, in the scenario of being a prosecutor during this time period. And it was a pretty lengthy time period. Jesse, I'm uh, from Houston, and I lived here during the Enron scandal. Uh, my best friend was the general counsel of uh, Dynagy, who attempted to buy Enron at one point. So I had a little uh-huh. bit of insight into what was going on with Enron. But then when the trials came around, and of course they were front page news here locally in the Houston Chronicle, reported on by Lauren Steffi and Mary Flood. Um, so I followed those quite closely. Uh, but the first thing I got from your book, which I was not aware of, was really the the Arthur Anderson part of it. And I have to say, I was one of the ones that completely bought into the myth that the guilty verdict destroyed Arthur Anderson. And it turned out that that really was only not quite right. But the story that I bought into, and I think a lot of us, and certainly in Houston, bought into, was really manufactured by a PR firm that Arthur Anderson hired. I was wondering if you might talk about that. Yeah, I think it's a remarkable story. And I'm glad that you uh, uh, like that part of the book. So um, the Arthur Anderson prosecution, of course, was one of the first things that the Enron task force did. And, um, and now is widely seen by defense lawyers and notably by many prosecutors within the DOJ and uh, high-level executive, you know, uh, officials that um, in the Obama administration um, came to view it as a disastrous mistake. And I wanted to reconstruct that. And part of the book's aim is to um, say that this was the legitimate prosecution. Um, and in fact, prosecutors had no choice. And what I wanted to try to solve is how did this conversation change from Arthur Anderson's destruction of evidence and obstruction of justice? How did it change from abetting accounting fraud at um, Enron and being enmeshed in that that energy traders fraud um, and really the handmaiden to it? Um, and so many others, Sunbeam and WorldCom and Global Crossing, the list goes on and on. Um, how did that change from that to this notion that they put so many people on the streets? And what I really did was kind of try to excavate and understand the PR campaign. And it was a remarkable PR campaign led by two very smart, wily Washington, D.C.-based PR uh, operatives, but also um, helped by the white-collar bar um, who really kind of relentlessly attacked uh, the prosecutors as cowboys who uh, overreached their authority. So, Paul, this would really be directed towards you because the other thing I learned from the book was the effect that the KPMG and, uh, indictment that led to the U.S. versus Stein case had on uh, some of your former colleagues. And in that case, the uh, sitting judge really excoriated the prosecutors uh, for the tactics they used in that case. And I think the uh, one of the chapter subheadings that Jesse uses is it killed the Thompson memo. I was wondering if you could tell us about that case and how uh, how you thought it affected uh, your colleagues at the Department of Justice. Yeah, well, first of all, it wasn't a case which um, I I prosecuted, but it was Southern District of New York, and 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 Jesse fairly got it right in, in the book, I believe. Um, it was a series of events not just that case, but it was a series of events. And that was probably the most seminal event that sort of ripped away what we always thought was sort of the prosecutorial, um, um, I'm not going to use the word infallibility, but I really don't mean that. But just the fact that you could act as a prosecutor within the rules and get the evidence you wanted in a legitimate way and 
and be allowed to proceed and not be personally vilified for that type of conduct. And I'll just give you an example. In, in, in many corporate cases that I've done where there's insider sort of uh, extortion or some sort of insider behavior where the company is, um, where, where people take money from the company itself, Corporations, in my experience, have been all too willing to to depart from the privilege and give you all the evidence that you need that was taken in a privilege context to to go after the wrongdoer who usually was an insider. And and, and it was during those periods of time that I understood that in, in many ways, asking corporations to waive the privilege was sort of an easy thing to do. And, and in many occasions, they, they willingly did it. When we got into sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, when we were actually looking at the corporations and the executives themselves, not not sort of internal people doing crimes uh, um, within the company, uh, theft or whatever, um, it was clear that the companies were sort of circling the wagons and hiding behind the privilege at the time when we were trying to extract um, information and evidence that would might implicate uh, management or, or someone in the company. So it was in that context that the, that the more, that the, um, w- what I call the, the principles of port prosecution memo came out. That was the Tom to be known as the Thompson memo. And that came out and it sort of said, um, listen, prosecutors, we're going to require companies to really waive the privilege and, and, and open the kimono for you. And so, um, as Jesse talks about in the book, I thought that that was a time when corporations sort of understood being good corporate citizens meant giving us as prosecutors what we needed to do to get to the bottom of the matter. Um, obviously, it, it required a waiver of attorney-client privilege in many instances. And when when the Stein case came out, for the first time, um, they said that literally by telling a, a company that um, that it would be a problem if they paid the attorney's fees for these individuals before the Sixth Amendment even attached, that that somehow um, would vitiate a criminal prosecution. That was that, that was a that was pretty pretty unique, and and I think it put a, a real pressure. It did put real pressure on the Thompson memo, and that's when. Um, that's when the McNulty memo came out and that's when some of the ground that we had gained as prosecutors in quickly getting to the bottom of these crimes and, 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 and prosecuting some of these executives, that's when we started losing the ground. I think Jesse aptly captured, captured that part in his book. Paul, if I could take a step back with you, uh, it's my understanding that you, uh, moved to Washington from the, um, uh, U S attorney's office in Miami and certainly from my perspective as an outsider on the civil side of things, uh, we always thought that the, uh, the, prosecu- uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami prosecuted a lot of people, went to trial a lot, uh, wasn't afraid to go down to the courthouse. Um, was that culture that you saw and participated in in Miami different from the culture you saw at Maine Justice or in Washington? Well, um First of all, you're right. That was the culture in Miami. And, um, and, and, uh, and when I got to Washington, when you say it was the culture, when I got to Washington, it was 2002. It was part of the Corporate Fraud Task Force. The Corporate Fraud Task Force, um, the President's Corporate Fraud Task Force, begin, began in July of 2002. And that's exactly when I arrived in D.C. So the culture actually at that time was similar to the culture that I had experienced in Miami because that's when the Thompson memo came out. The Thompson memo came out in early 2003, but there was a lot of support in what, when you're doing these types of high state cases and when you're, when you're sticking your neck out there to make a difference, it's vitally important that you have your supervisors and in, in DC, your political uh, appointees back you up when things go wrong and things invariably do in these kinds of cases. But as long as you're acting in good faith and moving forward, it's very important to know that when a judge rules against you or when, uh, or when a piece of evidence, you lose a piece of evidence because of whatever reason, a uh, witness changes his story or whatever, that 
your, your supervisors will support you. And I, I think when I got here in 2002 in Washington, I was supported. I was actually amazed at, that I was getting the same level of support in the criminal division fraud section as I believed uh, I was getting in Miami. It was really a heady time to be here if you were a corporate white collar prosecutor. So, Paul, that, that, did, that, that did begin to evaporate. <laughs> so I don't know if this translates from the civil side of things to the criminal side of things, but we always said if you haven't lost a case, that means you haven't been to the courthouse. And so the point being, you can't be afraid to go to the courthouse if you call yourself a trial lawyer. And as a trial lawyer, your your ultimate um, leverage is you'll take the opposite party to trial. Does that translate over to the criminal side as well? Without a doubt. Um, without a doubt. And I think uh, Jesse pr- pretty much captures that as well in the book. That um, and, and just to go back to a prior point. Arthur Anderson, look, look, I was a prosecutor when Arthur Anderson got prosecuted. I was here in Maine Justice, and I um, I was a prosecutor during the Corporate Fraud Task Force. And, and I didn't see that at the time as uh, um, affecting the change that ultimately Jesse captured in his book. Because as I was living through it, my job wasn't changing, and... I was getting the support from management and the political appointees in the way I always had. And so I didn't see that as this, as the sort of the seminal moment where things changed. But when you read the book you, and you put that in perspective with all the other things that are happening, which Jesse can go into, but, but now I, I look back and I can see that that was in fact an important changing point. Um, but it wasn't. It, it was a series of events. It wasn't just one event. And I think Jesse sort of carries or captures a lot of the, the the events in the book. But I don't think it was just that singular event. But but at the end of the day, prosecutors need to believe that when things go wrong, someone will have their back. And and in order to be effective, you have to say you're going to go to court. You have to mean it, and you have to be willing to go to court when 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 push comes to shove. And what Jesse captures in the book from Arthur Anderson onward is prosecutors, not necessarily prosecutors, but supervisors, managers, and politicos lost the will to prosecute these cases. And I completely agree with his point in that regard. Um, You know, I think that, thank you, Paul. I think that um, one of the important things that I, I felt was worth emphasizing is how slowly this happened um, and that this was not a decision. This wasn't Timothy Geithner calling up Eric Holder and saying, don't prosecute bankers. Um, And there wasn't a conspiracy like that. Um, And in fact, there was kind of institutional imperatives and incentives that had been building up for a long time that resulted in this. I, I think there were a lot of bad decisions and individuals who I'm trying to hold accountable in the book and naming them like Eric Holder and Lanny Brewer and Preet Bharara in the Southern District um, as culpable for having not, uh, you know, for dereliction of their duty. But the institution itself it doesn't know how anymore to prosecute top corporate executives um, effectively. Uh, and this was building for a long time. And one of the things is that they do very few trials. One of the things that Paul knew how to do and the Miami mafia, as they call themselves, guys who came out of the U.S. attorney's office in Miami knew how to do was trials. They were trial experts and they were brought up to D.C. to main justice by a previous regime for that expertise. And then the Obama administration really turned away from that and brought in a lot of um, defense lawyers who they thought wanted to, they wanted to professionalize the place. And in doing that, they really kind of lost this trial expertise. And you can't be a prosecutor if you're, um, don't have enough trial experience because juries are terrifying. They're unpredictable. Uh, and if you don't know how to explain complex white collar frauds where there isn't a body buried, there isn't a kilo of coke on the, um, desk, um, if there's a, a complex fraud like this, you need to be able to explain it and not be fearful that the jury is a foreign entity that uh, you can't predict or um, you can't communicate with. 
Paul, I wanted to, uh, excuse me, Jesse, I wanted to follow up um, on, uh, we talked about kind of the Arthur Anderson effect. We talked about the Stein case, and you've talked about, you and both Jesse talked about the changes at the top of the Department of Justice. What were some of the other steps that you thought were significant in getting us where we were from Enron and those uh, uh, prosecution and, and just stunning wins, or not stunning, but superlative wins by the Department of Justice up to the point we saw in 08 going forward where there weren't even any prosecutions? The biggest development now is that they settle corporation settle cases uh, with corporations for money rather than prosecuting either the corporation or the individuals at the top uh, levels. So the rise of the DPA and NPA is the most significant change. From 2001 to today, there have been over 420 deferred prosecution agreements with corporations. In the decade previous, there were 18. Um, and they didn't even exist uh, before they, uh, in the mid-1990s. So this is the new way that corporations are prosecuted in this country through settlements for money. And it's much worse than that because prosecution of corporations has been outsourced and privatized. And it's been outsourced and privatized to corporations themselves, wrongdoers themselves, which is akin to trying to figure out whether Pablo Escobar runs a drug cartel and asking him to hire a law firm in Medellin to investigate whether he runs a drug cartel or not. It's not going to work. It's not a good job, a good idea. And it's even worse than that because many of the young prosecutors now and is the pro DOJ is almost exclusively or it's very frequently now, especially in the most prestigious offices like D.C. and New York, a training ground for future defense lawyers at major law firms. Because it, that exists, what you're doing is you have young prosecutors who are training and negotiating with their boss's former boss on the other side of the table who they would like to one day work for. And uh, that does not result in um, courageous prosecutions of individuals. Um, it results in settlements with corporations. So in a past life, I was uh, in-house counsel at uh, major energy companies in Houston. And when I would sit, or I never had the uh, opportunity to sit across the table from Paul, fortunately, but if I was put in that situation, uh, I, I would desperately want to settle. And I would want to settle not only to try to uh, absolve as much guilt as possible, but also, to me, it really doesn't matter what the fine and penalty is, because uh, once the amount's certain, then I can reserve for it. And certainty is what corporations want. So, uh, if that's going to help drive the overall uh, compliance with the law, uh, do you really feel like uh, that's a negative development? And I guess I'll throw that to both of you guys. Well, let, let, let me uh, let me go there first, just because I, I think this is one place where I slightly diverge from Jesse. I, 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 um, from an overarching perspective, I agree with everything he just said, but I think that I, I think that. CPAs, when used appropriately, uh, are, are effective ways to both change corporate culture and to punish criminal corporate conduct. I think what Jesse, where I agree with Jesse, is that it seems like the department has moved away from the hard work of investigating and prosecuting and taken the easy way out in many ways um, um, with just doing DPAs. So what, in answer to your prior question, um, I, I I think that when you look at the Arthur Anderson case, I, I I follow a line of cases where it was obvious to people who were the rank and file in the Department of Justice that bringing tough cases and losing them were going to be job killers, and I think that that message rang true loud and clear. Not from necessarily Stein and not from necessarily Anderson, but certainly Stein was when it started. But after that, we had the Senator Stevens case. Now, it wasn't your typical corporate white collar case. But if you remember what happened in Stevens, the prosecutors, before they were, before there was any type of due process, 
the prosecutors were hung out to dry. And this happened after the new administration came in. They were hung out to dry and to the point where one of them ended up taking his own life. I can tell you all the people I knew in the Department of Justice, the career people who, who cared and, and wanted to do the right thing every day and wanted to make a difference every day, were impacted by the department's response to that loss, number one. And then when you go to the corporate fraud side, when the prosecutors uh, in EDNY lost the Bear Stearns case, I believe that that was the reflection of the department. What happened in the department at that point in time was they took that case as a sign that these cases were too hard to win. Now, as a line prosecutor, you're going to win and you're going to lose cases, and it's no big deal. I mean, you know, you never, as a prosecutor, you never want to lose a case. But those series of cases that we've talked about, culminating in the Bear Stearns case, I think created the notion amongst at least Maine Justice and AUSAs across the country that if you lost a case, your career, it it could be jeopardy on your career. And I think that that changed both the way career prosecutors looked at these cases and the way the political appointees looked at these cases. And I personally think that had more of an impact than what Jesse talked about in terms of the DPAs. But I think that that's sort of what forced prosecutors and or political appointees to accept DPAs as the best way to resolve these issues when, when frankly, it it wasn't if that's all you're doing. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of what I observed and what I saw. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I would uh, just add that I, you know, I completely agree with Paul that those, those losses in the Stevens case um, really affected the way they did it. And um, uh, one thing is it affected the way the Obama administration came in and saw the uh, the Department of Justice. And I think they really saw that they perceived it as a, a mess from the um, second term of George W. Bush. And there were uh, major embarrassments and problems. There was the U.S. attorney firing scandal. There was the Monica Goodling uh, uh, scandal where there was uh, meddling from um, front office and hiring that uh, was they were really kind of unqualified. Um, there was the Ted Stevens case, and they just wanted to sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and so that that changed the way prosecutors thought about doing their jobs and going about doing their jobs. And so they were really kind of trying to um, uh, clean things up and uh, in the wrong way. They were overly zealous about it. Meanwhile, up in the Southern District, you had a different issue, which was no one was really minding the store down in Maine Justice or telling people what the priorities were. So Preet Bharara, in, even though there was this colossal collapse right in his backyard of all, from all the banks, he was on a mining a vein of in, insider trading cases and winning a lot. And they didn't want to take the risk of losing a complex case in the CDO business uh, that was very difficult when they had this kind of spectacular wiretap evidence of um, in insider trading and they were getting hedge funds and they were getting great press. He was called the sheriff of Wall Street, even though he wasn't policing Wall Street. He was policing hedge funds, a different thing than investment banks. So, um, you know, the incentive structure really was don't take risks, don't go after these kind of trials. These trials are very difficult and complex. Look at the Bear Stearns case. And meanwhile, we can uh, make our reputations by doing other kinds of easier cases like insider trading. So, Paul, did it really get so bad that uh, it would be viewed as a career killer within the department if you lost one case? (laughs) um, That's the way I saw it. Um, wow. I mean, uh, I mean, not, 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 not any case, obviously, but some of these high stakes litigation right. where, um, and Jesse goes through a lot of them in his book, but these high stakes cases that pose an enormous challenge to winning, um, at every level, but cases which need to be brought to, to, and which the department had always brought, um, 
for, for, for many years prior to that. Um, I, I, um, I lived through and worked in Miami when we were doing the savings and loan cases and bringing literally hundreds, thousands of, of bank executives to justice. Obviously, I, I lived through the Enron Task Force where we, we sort of, that, uh, the corporate fraud task force time where we, where we learned to do those same things with respect to corporate executives and accounting fraud. And for, during both those periods of time, it was never an issue that if you lost a case, it'd be a problem. No prosecutor in the right mind wants to lose a case, but all all um, pro- white collar prosecutors worth their salt know that you can lose these cases for an abundance of reasons, most of which you can't even foresee, no matter how good of a prosecutor you are. So um, there, there was never a, a question that winning or losing was was going to be a, a problem for your career, unless, of course, you, you lost it in a, in a way that um, that brought ethics charges against you. That's obviously not uh, uh, what I'm talking about. But um, clearly, after Stevens, that mix changed for, and and to some degree, Stein, that mix changed for sure. Paul, in uh, kind of my uh, soliloquy about why, as a corporate lawyer, I I really preferred a deferred prosecution or a non-prosecution agreement, it was one of the ways I thought uh, both the uh, legal profession and maybe even the greater corporate America pushed back. Uh, you t- detailed a lot of the things that happened after Enron in terms of the American Bar Association, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and really uh, the lobbying effort and the pushback that and and big law firms uh, did uh, against uh, the Justice Department in both the Bush and the Obama administration. Could you tell us a little bit about some of those efforts? In my remarks about the deferred prosecution agreements and why, Mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, corporate lawyer, I I would uh, want to have something like that is one subtle way that corporate America pushed back. But you talked about really a wide variety of tactics and pushbacks. There was a big lobbying campaign in the middle of the decade against the Thompson memo using both the Stein case, the KPMG case, and before it, the Arthur Anderson case to argue that white collar prosecutions had gone too far, that the DOJ was full of cowboys, they were too aggressive, they were overcharging. Um, And uh, they used the Enron task force too. They pointed to um, mistakes that the Enron task force had made and overzealous prosecutions. Um, the, they lost the broadband uh, trial against executives at Enron. There was the Jamie Olis case in Dynegy that looked really um, overzealous, and I think was. Um, so uh, my argument, um, as a side note, is that the Enron task force did a very good job of prosecuting with um, ha- having learned from mistakes, but uh, I think they is undeniably that they made mistakes. But what happened was there was a lobbying effort, and as you say, it was coordinated by the American Bar Association, and they found weak points. And one of the weak points was this notion that this kind of sacrosanct attorney-client privilege was being serially violated by uh, the Department of Justice, and that they were extorting companies to give up attorney-client privilege. Um, And irrespective of whether you agree with that or not, um, that has changed the way, changed the tools that prosecutors can use to get access to information from corporations. Corporations no longer have to give, um, no longer sort of have to waive attorney-client privilege, and they still can get credit for having cooperated with the investigation. Now, my view is, okay, if you can't, if they don't, give up privileged information, that's fine. Um, we want to protect that principle in, in American jurisprudence, but then the company shouldn't get credit for having cooperated because it's actually not really cooperating. Um, and so uh, they really, the prosecutors haven't kind of turned and started, and now uh, analyzing it that way. They and I'll give an example. The Southern District came up with, uh, was investigating Toyota over um, its airbags and um, what the executives knew. And Toyota said, go pound sand. We're not going to give you access to a number of crucially important executives who uh, really would have known about this high-level executive. And so the Southern District schemed and um, was very annoyed by this. And uh, 
um, and then did not indict the company, did not punish the company any more severely than having a very large settlement. A large settlement that shareholders write the check for is not the kind of thing that's going to um, deter white collar crime. So I wanted to maybe end with uh, kind of the same question uh, to both of you all, which is generally uh, how how would we uh, change this or how would we get back on track where uh, uh, if if the uh, pen, uh, pendulum is swung too far, how do we get it more back in the middle? Well, um, first of all, that's a I'll let Jesse uh, conclude on this one, but but from from a, just a DOJ perspective. The first thing that I would suggest, and one of the things that I've always not quite understood is that, for instance, when a company um, gets involved in a, a criminal activity, the government always asks them to do a look back, to, 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 to look back, find out how the problem occurred, why it occurred, and then we can tell how to fix it once we've dug in and done the look back. Um, it's, it's always been amazing to me that despite the fact that it's a pretty commonly accepted uh, principle by now that the department didn't answer the bell after the 2008 financial crisis, I'm not aware of the department ever d doing any introspection at all, for, certainly publicly, as to what happened and why. I'm hoping Jesse's book sort of spurs that. But from, from where I sat, um, and what we've talked about in this phone call is the fact that there has been a, a flight of experienced trial savvy white collar attorneys, white collar trial attorneys from the government. And I think that they have to make, spend a lot of time to get, to, to train up a new force to do that, to, 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 to be able to handle these crises when they hit so that the DOJ can answer the bell again. Number one. And number two, I think that they, they need to train their prosecutors. Um, they, they need to start training their prosecutors. During the corporate fraud task force, we used to have, I used to train prosecutors four or five times a year at, at the National Advocacy Center in, um, in South Carolina. From 2009 forward, they, they basically stopped those courses. They stopped training prosecutors how to do these cases. And even today, I'm aware that this year they have one basic white collar training course at the NAC, one, and it's a basic course. So I think that someone has to have a sustained and committed effort over in the Department of Justice to, to hire, train, and retain lawyers to do this. And um, uh, just from a larger perspective, I think the department has to figure out a way to let prosecutors know that when they lose cases um, for no other reason than we can't win all the cases, that that's not going to be a black mark on them. And uh, that, to me, that's that's where I would start. Um, I, you know, I, I think those are very good and correct um, uh, proposals. I, w the Department of Justice is a very strange beast as a government bureaucracy. It doesn't do a lot of careful policy thinking. There are the 93 offices around the country that uh, with, run by U.S. attorneys, and U.S. attorneys essentially think of their main job as ignoring everything that Washington says. Um, individual prosecutors are very entrepreneurial about their cases, and very few of them, if any, are thinking from a 30,000-foot view about um, policy. How uh, has our approach to white collar crime changed over the last decade? What, um, you know, they gather numbers, but the numbers aren't particularly meaningful or useful. And they're always trying to just get more, get more and higher numbers. It's not like they're uh, analyzing the, for their approach. So here, my proposals in a nutshell are one, pay prosecutors a lot more money. It's never going to happen. Um, none of these proposals are really going to happen, especially under the Sessions DOJ. Um, but, you know, I think that they should be paid so much money, like $400,000, that they, that it would make going, they, a lot of these people want to do public service and are really committed to it and are decent and very smart and able people. If they were able to put their kids through private school or very good schools and colleges in some of the most affluent cities in the world, like New York and DC with the most expensive cities, um, they would stay 
stay and do this job. And I don't think we should have exclusively lifers, but some people, we shouldn't have uh, six years and out at the Department of Justice for young people who are training to become future white collar defense partners. That's step one. Step two is they should, the focus should be on individuals. The primary focus should be the goal of um, what prosecutors do is to prosecute individuals, not pieces of paper like corporations. They should prosecute individuals. The prosecution of a corporation should be a last resort, and the last last resort should be a settlement. Settlements should be rare with the corporations themselves, um, only under extreme, you know, attenuating circumstances. And then I think they should recruit differently. I think they should get fewer young people uh, from the elite law schools. They should get geographic diversity, professional experience diversity. So you get more plaintiffs lawyers, more consumer protection lawyers, more academics. Um, and you should get older people, older people who are refugees from white collar defense who don't want to go back to it, didn't like it, uh, or um, made their money and are satisfied with their careers, uh, know where the bodies are buried and want to uh, serve the public and serve the government. Um, that would be, I think, a way to kind of break this cycle of the revolving door and this lack of expertise and wisdom and trial experience. Well, gentlemen, I really want to thank you. This has just been a ton of fun for me. I've been visiting with Jesse Isinger, uh, senior uh, reporter at ProPublica, on his book, which came out in July, The Chicken Chick Club. Paul Pelletier, partner at Pepper Hamilton, who's with the Department of Justice during uh, much of the time frame this book goes through. Uh, gentlemen, it's been great. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself, and I really want to thank both of you for taking the time to visit with me. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Tom and Jesse. It's always a pleasure. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. As I indicated in my opening, I'm going to link to my blog post about this interview and my book review of the Chicken Chick Club. I'm also going to link to the Everything Compliance Gang's book review of the Chicken Chick Club. I'm also going to link to the book itself if you want to purchase a copy. And if you have not read this and you're the in the compliance space, I would urge you to purchase this book and read it. It is, uh, I think, one of the most important books that you'll read. It certainly explains how we got to the type of FCPA and more uh, broadly white-collar prosecutions that we have today. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and help get the word out about the top podcast in compliance. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode next week. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.